Well, welcome to um, this interesting evening, which I'm sure is going to be extremely stimulating. My name is Ben Goodger. I'm one of the partners here at Osborne Park. And we're very delighted to welcome Rohit and his fellow speakers to discuss the future of business. Um, one of the reasons that I know Rohit, uh, I, I met him years ago, but I, I reconnected with him, is because Osborne Park is, is very interested in lots of aspects of the connected world and in particular the smart cities thing that many of you may have heard about. And we had a, 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 a really interesting debate about what it means to have a smart city, what, is, what are the implications of that, in technology terms, but in social terms, legal stuff, regulation, uh, intellectual property, all that sort of stuff. That's, that's, that's the thing we get excited about. But um, Rohit here came to a terrific speech um, at an event we held in Bristol, chaired by Ken Livingston. Um, and uh, I would urge you to have a look at um, what we as a firm are trying to do in terms of thought leadership on that. And there's a website which is um, ocsmartcities.com. If you look that up, we, we've had a survey done of what, are, what people regard as the key things for a smart city. But it's, it's a much broader discussion than that. Uh, and we're also looking at things like the connected consumer, that sort of thing. But, so that's just to set the scene for why we are very delighted to have people like Rohit here to stimulate your thinking and hopefully all of our thinking about what the future business is going to look like. So with that, I shall hand over to Rohit. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is a kind of mad endeavor that we, we set out on. Um, end of January, I kind of had this desire to do something that would have influence at the kind of most senior levels of the organisation, so really get people thinking about the future. And I thought about the idea of doing my own book, and I realised that if I wrote one, I would be semi pregnant for about two years because I'm a Virgo, and therefore it's affection is the only standard I'm willing to take, and therefore I don't write many books. Um, so instead, I thought, well, why don't we try and get multiple people to contribute, and then we kind of honour bound to them to deliver it. Uh, and also, um, I wanted to involve a team of people that I trusted, so I went to Steve at the back and said, what do you think of the idea? He said, it's really stupid, let's do it. Um, so we, we went out and, and we talked to various people and said, how long would it take to do a book with 20 different contributors? And they said, you've got about 18 months to two years. Dark in itself because the ideas that someone's talking about that are fresh today, everyone will be talking about them in 18 months to two years' time, and so therefore there won't be much of a future in that. The conversation will be out there. We want to stimulate thinking. So we said we really have to do it within four to six months. So we set the target of uh, beginning of February of bringing the book out in June, and you're holding copies of it now. We went out to various people we knew and said, Will you write for us? Uh, some people did Flying. Some people said yes, and we're still waiting for the chapter. Uh, a number of people did say yes, and then we put some calls out for proposals. And we ended up with over 70 people offering chapters, and we ended up with 62 contributors, 60 chapters, uh, 21 different countries. Really interesting ideas. And for us, it's a good example of bringing exponential thinking that you're seeing in the technology world and bringing it to business, like a, you know, an exponential delivery of a book. Um, and so we're very excited, the whole thing took 19 weeks. What we're going to have today is three presentations. So uh, I'm going to open up with a kind of little tour of some of the ideas. I'm not going to go through all 60 chapters. But I'm going to tour through some of what we think are kind of the big ideas in the book. Then Grace Scott is going to take you on a bit of a journey. Grace, come over to the States to be with us for this. Uh, and he talks about the simulated, simulated reality, singularity. Uh, a fascinating presentation which is kind of out there beyond where out there is. <coughs> and then Gerd is going to talk to us about the, the, the challenges of balancing off man and machine in the world we're in today, the kind of the debate that's raging about man versus machine. So we're each going to talk for about 25 minutes and then five minutes of questions for each one of us and then we'll have like a half an hour QA at the end just to kind of have a general chat. Okay, so <coughs> let's dive in. Where do we start? I think what's going on in the world today is we're seeing the clash between two different civilizations, or like two planets, two worlds of life. On the one hand, there are those of us who are, if you like, born physical and think physical, 
we make cars, we build houses, we do legal contracts, we do financial services. We see the world as a very physical place. Technology was something we've always seen as a neighbor or a cost center, but it's not what we do as a business. We tend to think in relatively incremental ways about how we can drive improvement, and we have a quite an analog mindset. We're now collided with a world of people and organizations that were born digital. Organizations that don't see cars, houses, people, bank accounts, all they see is data. And for them, their view is that actually they can tackle any problem by finding the right algorithms and applying the right science and technology to deliver against that. The other big thing is those people have grown up in Moore's Law, this idea that computer power doubles every 18 to 24 months. And their view is that exactly that same exponential thinking can be applied to business. So you've got this clash between the exponentials on one side, and the exponential digital thinkers and the analog physical thinkers. And it's, it, we're seeing that play out now in every single industry where people are talking about digital transformation with an unclear sense of where they're going to get to. Many people seem to think it's just about buying more technology rather than a real change in their DNA. But some are beginning to understand that actually we do need to shift our DNA. Again, within that, you see some people thinking that actually we can get there by playing within the existing rules here. We know who our competitors are, we know how they behave. When they do something different, we know why they've done it, and we know what they're going to do next. And if we can play within that rule set, we can get to a future that seems relatively safe because we understand it. But then there are others who say, actually, no, in order to succeed in your world, we're going to change the whole game. So if you look in telecoms, all the telecoms companies will tell you that they had the idea of Skype first, the idea of giving away free telephony over the internet. But they also said, well, why would we do that? Why would we give away our product? Nothing. So whoever had that idea was back in the labs or spending more time with their family, but certainly not you know, part of the business. Then along came Skype and said, we're going to do exactly that. We're going to take your core business and we're going to give it away for free. We'll make our money out of premium services on the back of that. Skype now has 40% of all telecoms traffic internationally. has about 1,600 staff doing that. Fundamentally changed the game in telecoms. And we're seeing this in sector after sector now. Where somebody's coming in and basically rewriting the rules of the game. Uh, or changing the game itself. And players in the sector have to choose whether they can get there by playing with the rule set or whether they have to start thinking about changing the game themselves. We also know that you know, we, we're in a world where understanding the long-term horizon has become more and more important. There's a couple of seats down here in front of you. Uh, and, and what we're seeing is people take an active approach to this. So thinking about three different time horizons. Firstly, being clear on what they're trying to bring home to land in the next 12 months. Secondly, thinking about well, where is innovation and growth going to come from in the next one to three years, and being very mindful of what's changing in the world around us that could impact that, that could assist our strategy or get in the way of it. And then finally, there are those who are looking forward to 10 years out, who are saying, actually, we need an early warning system. We need a radar to tell us what's coming over the horizon so we can make better informed decisions today, understanding these bigger shifts that are happening because we're in juggernaut organizations where it might take five years to bring about this kind of change. We don't turn on a dime. We also know that we're in a world where we're facing some quite fundamental challenges. We know global debt. Today, it is you know, so its highest levels. The rich economies have a debt of 100% GDP. We, if we look at derivatives contracts, subprime was an example of derivatives that triggered the last downturn. Now the estimate is derivatives are worth three quadrillion dollars. Trillion. So more than 40 times the size of the entire global economy. We have these big four points. And then we have various people saying, actually, we're working in new fields of science and technology that are creating existential sources of risk, whether it's artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, new materials, nanotechnology, precise manufacturing, whatever it is. These could become so wild and out of control that they could be new sources of risk for our planet. Businesses are becoming more as you sit in the boardrooms of you know, leading corporations, these are issues that are now on the agenda. People are beginning to understand this. What we're also beginning to understand is that we don't really know very much about our planet. To the extent that Nick Bostrom, the Oxford philosopher, brought uh, a book out for superintelligence a little while ago, which is about where artificial intelligence can go, and he actually suggests that we might be living in the matrix. We might actually be living in the digital simulation of a higher intelligence for another planet. And as much as we laugh at that, we wouldn't know. Because much like Neo in the Matrix, he had no clue until Morpheus came along and explained it to him. So how are we? 
uh, which is kind of an interesting thing to say. What we do know, though, definitely, is that we are an, a very digitized species. More and more of our lives have been digitized. And we're connected to this global brain called the internet. Even with our artificial intelligence, three billion of us are connected and using it now, more and more as the backbone for everything we do. But what we're moving into is creating some fundamental design tensions of business leaders as we try and lay out our strategy for tomorrow. There are some very tough choices that we have to wrestle with about where we go next. Some sort of philosophical things that we have to think about. One is this issue of, you know, do we follow the crowd? Do we just do what everyone else does? And if you look at the stuff that's going on around digital transformation, that's very much the story today. You know, people diving in without necessarily knowing where they're going and why they're doing it, but they're doing it. Or do we start to follow our curiosity? Do we actually break from the pack and do things that are totally different? So you see the company now starting to experiment with asteroid like human augmentation, even into things like legalized marijuana. What's fascinating again is you're getting executives from Microsoft in, in Seattle quitting <coughs> to go and set up legalized marijuana businesses, but then the local banks, law firms, and accountants won't work with them. Because for them it's clear, it's too risky. So then what you're getting is people going, actually, it's like Microsoft there. They used to be a client. I'm going to leave my law firm and I'm going to set up a new practice specializing in marijuana. And actually, it could be a very profitable business because everyone needs a lawyer in that world. And so you're getting sub-ecosystems developing based around the people who are willing to follow their curiosity into these new spaces. We're also seeing a massive rise in, in new developments in financial technology. Uh, uh, way of new developments, crowdsourced funding, and all sorts of different platforms, whether it's raising debt and equity, whether it's invoice discounting or person to person loans. Every single thing that the financial services industry does, someone is now creating an alternative platform. Businesses have been forced to say, well, actually, which one should I go with? I can pay my normal bank £30 to do an international money transfer, or something transfer wise are offering to do it for £1.50. This because actually in the same way as we took a while to move from BT on Skype, maybe we do this again. And what we're seeing now is that the Wall Street banks are actually starting to invest in these companies because they realise that they may not be able to change themselves. So they've got to invest in the things that can actually eat their lunch. And then, we're going to talk about this a lot more. There is this constant backdrop now in society about will we see technological unemployment? We're seeing a massive rate of automation. Uh, Oxford University did some research that said 47% of all job prices today could be automated out of existence in the next 10 15 years. Other, or 15 years sorry, others are saying that within 15 years, 80% of everything we know today could just have disappeared, either because no one needed or it's been automated. So companies are having to face a choice now about well, are we going to pursue the automation route or are we going to invest in humanity? Are we going to take a conscious choice to employ people and keep them going in our organisation because we see that? Either way, we've got a debate raising about what happens to the people who may not employ. Will they find new jobs in the industries of tomorrow? Or will there be a gap between the number of jobs created and the number of jobs lost? And if I'm a lawyer leaving court to look up today, do I really want to be an Uber driver, rent out my spare bedroom on Airbnb, when it's not being rented out on Airbnb, use it for Amazon storage, and then do some over delivery for Amazon, rent out the space on my computer, to share my drive with other people and be in a car sharing scheme. <coughs> Those are all kind of interesting, but is that a career that you know, people are growing up today want? You know, is that the story they want for the future? And so, those are really having to make these choices and help their staff make those kind of choices. What we also see is so much of the discussion today is a very technical, technocratic one about technology, about measurement, about algorithms, about software doing it all. And take it, it's becoming very massive in many respects. And there's a growing discussion about, well, actually, some of the stuff that really makes businesses different and successful is what you call them, it? intuition, imagination, connection, all those kinds of things. But those both qualitative characteristics that make these companies feminine. And there's this discussion about conscious leadership or whatever it is. How do you balance those two in the organization tomorrow? And then finally, there's this kind of Star Wars versus Star Trek. In more and more sectors, we're seeing this pursuit of growth, this winner takes almost all mentality. If you think about search on the internet, you know, who's the number two behind Google? You're a long, long way behind. And the same is happening in many sectors. 
I said, organizations are again being challenged to say, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to go out there and play and go for the big grand Star Wars, battle it out with people? Or are you buying into this new kind of abundance mindset that says, actually, <coughs> look at it, the price of manufactured goods is dropping to almost zero with 3D printing, vertical farming, pink LED farms could bring food costs <coughs> down, the internet's a free distribution mechanism for information, music, whatever. There are a number of things happening that start to move us to a greater abundance in society. And potentially the kind of federation model that we see in Star Trek, and the kind of key thing about Star Trek is we have no money. There's no money in the version of Star Trek. And there's, there's economists now doing serious studies about well, what would a Star Trek economy look like and how would we get there. So organizations are having to think about what is our general philosophy? Are we going out there to win it all? Or are we trying to help create an abundant world? And you're seeing that back in play out even today. All that provides a backdrop for, for the kind of choices about well, what sectors we're going to play in and what technologies we're going to use. And what we see across the book is people highlighting some just incredibly disruptive and game-changing technologies from you know, 4D printing that will give us objects that change their properties over time to uh, blockchain technology, synthetic biology, creating new life forms potentially the uploading of the brain, the augmentation of the human body, a whole range of science and technology developments coming together at quite an accelerated pace to, to again change the game in existing sectors and drive new ones. Underpinning all that is this evolution in size, speed and performance of our technology. We've gone from the mainframe to the desktop to the luggable, the portable, the mobile and the smartphone. The smartphone has pretty much changed our world in the last nine years. Now what happens in the next nine? Well, one of the things we know that's starting is the whole shift to wearable technologies. These were being implemented three to five years ago, becoming more commonplace from watches to health monitoring devices. So if these were patented three to five years ago, what's been patented in the last three? It's embedded technologies. A whole range of technologies that are starting to come into the human body. There are already millions of people with pacemakers, cochlear implants, ocular implants, already out there. We're now seeing embedded technologies for health monitoring, for memory, for mobile phone, for sensory enhancement will be coming to market or already in the marketplace. And we know that all this is connected. Uh, firstly, to the internet of everything, 15 to 20 years from now, we can expect to see 50 to 250 billion devices connected to web. Phones, computers, or whatever replaces them, cars, fridges. But then those in turn are connected to a whole range of sensors, potentially about a trillion sensors by that time, all throwing off data, which we are going to use to enhance people's lives or drown in as organizations. But for me, the really interesting piece is the multi-sensory aspect of this. Last year, you could buy into something on Kickstarter called the OPPO that lets you transmit up to 356 different smells to someone else with an OPPO. There's also people working on touch and taste stimulation via what that means is that three and five years from now, it will be very likely that when you buy a hotel room, you'll be able to choose it by tasting the food in the restaurant, smelling the bath products, and feeling the bed linens all buying the device. Think about the number of retail sectors that are going to go through a fundamental change for mass the whole way we sell will change. And I'm going to talk a lot more about AI later, but clearly the, the bigger game change in all of these is artificial intelligence. If you fly on a plane, if you buy a financial services product, if you use a mobile phone, if you do internet search, you're using weak AI. It's getting stronger and smarter all the time. It doesn't match human cognition levels. But there's a lot of discussion about if and when it could and whether it would replicate human consciousness or get anywhere close and it simply replicate the what functions. And lots of different arguments about that. What we do know is that what we're moving into is becoming so information rich and so fast that more and more of us will start to adopt these intelligent systems ready in basic forms like Siri, things that mediate our relationship with the outside world, manage our information, gather information for us, trade our information. And the idea of our digital twin, a, a, a replica of us that might sit online and, and negotiate on our behalf whether we're going to buy tickets or gather information. All of these things are coming to market now. You might have seen a site called eternity.me, which is fascinating. It's like you can put your profile into this site and keep adding to it. It uses artificial intelligence to basically advise people on your behalf. So it gives you digital immortality, but long after you're dead, you can carry on irritating your friends.
by saying what you think must be no, my children don't listen to me now, they said they're going to listen to me when I'm dead. Um, so, let's all just think, all this science and technology advance is happening is going to spawn a number of new industries or transform existing ones. And we identified six clusters, a total of 30 technologies, that, uh, 30 industries, that we think are going to be the sort of bedrock of, of, of the economy 15 years out from now. The first is a cluster around information from mobile, which itself could be a 10 to 20 trillion dollar sector, to all those other sectors that we're starting to see emerge, that individually are all going to be at least a trillion dollars in, in value, that they are going to show up well. Secondly, a set of technologies that will change the way we manufacture and the way we do construction. A third set are around the transformation of various key industry sectors. A big one for me is infrastructure. Today, people are talking about even 30 to 100 trillion dollars of infrastructure globally. We have to do that faster, we have to do that cheaper, so it's going to require some quite transformational thinking to see how we make that happen. A fourth sector is all around how we power the planet and how we manage our environment. <coughs> Again, lots of ideas about where this can be. We know that these are going to be huge sectors. The next set that I think is quite interesting are around services for the citizens and, the, uh, and things that manage our domestic infrastructure. Particularly interesting to me are all the things about the modification. Uh, we've got quite a few chapters in the book that people explore from the idea of creating high street body shops where, in the same way as you go in and get your nails done today or a tattoo, you would go in and whether it's having 3D prosthetic limb uh, rooms <coughs> printed or using gene editing techniques, have the colour of your eyes and the texture of your skin changed, this idea that we would go in and start to modify ourselves on the high street. And then people say, you know, things like longevity, just enhancing the life expectancy, could alone be a six trillion dollar industry. Society itself has a kind of infrastructure to it, and I think there's a lot of things coming that are going to change that. One of the most exciting ones for me is this rise of the sharing economy. Uh, you're now seeing BMW in their car sharing schemes having 16 people share a single car. That is a big shift from the, you know, the only one by four. Actually, only about eight of those people. Eight of them have never thought about the car in the first place. So it's, it's taking away some sales, but it's also a really new person in the story. All of this is forcing businesses to think about what are the strategies, what are the business models, and what are the behaviors that we want to pursue to take into the marketplace. And I see there's this kind of combination of magic and magic in there. A bit like the dragon. You know, on the one hand, it's a beautiful, mythical, magical creature. On the other hand, they don't use it now. Yeah, it happen. One of the examples of magic is people thinking about new business models. We're used to the idea now people change, change the way they finance their assets. Cloud computing, uh, not, you know, not only the asset, but basically payment usage. People changing the way they finance innovation using platforms like Kickstarter to decide to have the market determine whether you should make a product in order to invest in the money and then finally there's the market for you. But the one the area that I think we're seeing a lot of really interesting innovation is around the way we charge for goods and services. And there's more and more ideas coming there. The one I like best though is the auction board because it really is a license. This is a site called madbid.com and how it works is that when you make a bid, the price goes up by one penny. But you pay a bidding fee of one pound fifty. So in this first example, we're selling a TV for six hundred and thirty pounds. 25 seconds in to go in the auction, the winning bid is pretty happy because they've made 20,059. As a vendor, I'm slightly happier because I've had 2,059 bids of each, which means I've made over 3,000 pounds. In the second example, I'm selling a 614 pound laptop. 26 seconds to go, I've made nearly 9,000 pounds. But the one that makes you leap out bread to bed in the morning and want to go to work, and want to send letters to everyone who told you you'd never make it, is the last one, where you're selling money. Here we're selling 125 pounds. Four seconds into my auction, I've made 81 pounds. But you'll sell that at 125 pounds between 10 pounds and 50 pounds, which means you'll make between 1,500 and 7,500 pounds if you're 125 pounds out there. I'm not sure that is it. What we're seeing is people willing to start experimenting with different ways of charging for goods and services. We're also seeing a recognition that with business cycle shortening and getting faster, 
we need to get faster in the way we deliver. We need to bring exponential thinking into every sector. My favorite example is in the construction industry. This is a Chinese company that built this 30 story hotel in 15 days. Because basically, they prefabricated all in the factory and what they do is assemble it on site. And they're building several things around the world. Their view is actually, if we wait two to three years from when we get the license to put the hotel up, the market will change. And then it's a big waste of money. So why not do it faster? That, that idea of exponential thinking is spreading to many, many industries. If you look at Airbnb, um, they're taking the idea that, you know, we see the water all the time, the computer power every eight and three more months and say, can we apply for business? Airbnb, 90 times more bedrooms listed, listed per employee than the hotel. Uh, you look at Tangerine, seven times more customers per employee than the average bank. If your organization gave yourself permission to just look for ideas, what kind of exponential opportunities might drop out? The one I love, though, is the local motors one. One now. They can produce a new car design about a thousand times cheaper than a traditional manufacturer. They can produce each car five to twenty times faster. Why? Well, the typical Ford has about five thousand components. The typical 3D printed Strati has about fifty. Fundamentally changing your assumption about how the industry works and how the world is happening. There's a return on investment here. If you look at the, the companies that are operating exponentially, they're also getting an exponential market cap growth. Uber, uh, well, from 2 billion to 40 billion in three years. Basically, recycling capacity of the economy. And what's interesting now is more mature businesses are saying, can we not? That's it. I mentioned Amazon. Amazon are now looking at the idea of rather than them doing the distribution in DHL bit for them, that you would do storage for Amazon at your home. You do the deliveries on their behalf. Recycling scale of this thing. One of the most interesting things that we're seeing happen is the kind of rise of the blockchain economy. We've heard about Bitcoin as a digital currency, there are now 500 out there. The really interesting thing about Bitcoin, though, is the underlying technology of the blockchain. It's a super secure protocol for communicating information. The health service is looking at it for the effective health data. All of the banks are exploring where you put transactions in there. Industry after industry is saying, actually, this is really interesting because what the blockchain does is create this giant distributed ledger across the net. It's not, there's no central clearinghouse, but everywhere you can see the records of all the transactions. If someone tries to change a transaction, it ripples all the way through the blockchain because each blockchain includes the color code of the, of the previous block. So you can't make any changes, and it's instantly visible. And this gives us the idea of potentially creating self-executing contracts, smart contracts, that have all their clauses written into them, so you wouldn't have a lawyer in now. When you, sorry. I know you're most of this, but there. Um, you know, your contract will basically say, have all the clauses been fulfilled? Great, I'll execute them. So assets would then start to have their own digital identity. People say, well, actually, this, this is really interesting, because what we can start to do is to create organizations that exist entirely in software from the strategy right the way through to the operating everything could just be written in software. We could have no people in the organization. And there's already discussion about the idea of um, having autonomous cars that literally own themselves. So you would have all the people who contribute to the manufacture of the car wouldn't get paid up front. What they would get is a stream of income from that car. The car would go out and rent itself to people 24-7 because it's driverless and it goes where it needs to. It can keep its accounts on the blockchain so it's completely transparent and it can just redistribute money and money to the people who are part of it. That could extend to entire organisation. We, we have a kind of fundamental potential here to reshape the way organisations operate and get to this idea of non owned entities. We also know that if you look at the rate of advance of robotics, artificial <coughs> intelligence, holograms, the workplace five to ten years' time is going to be very different. Today. We are going to see a variety of different actors play there. I would say that there are very few HR organizations that have even the most basic clue about how they're going to manage your workforce when you've got robots, some AI software, humans enhanced humans, and holograms representing the people who can't be with you at this moment, all working in the same entity. <laughs> and this is no longer science fantasy or science fiction, this is you know, all starting to happen now. 
All this means that we're going to need a different skill set inside the organization as individuals to help us navigate the future, whether it's scenario thinking, problem solving, collaboration, a whole range of new skills that are going to be critical to the design of tomorrow's organization and the design of tomorrow's individual. That's great. That's largely taking kind of what's out there and what you can see happening out there now, or it's just around the corner, or you know, if you read a little bit, you find this stuff. What about a little bit further? I'm going to leave most of the further out to break. But a couple of things I think are really interesting. One is there's a lot of work going on around understanding the human brain and how we store information. Lots of projects trying to find different ways of, of actually extracting the data from all your works with the idea of uploading all Google and IBM see this as a game changer project, backing your brain up, creating your exit content. The fascinating thing is that information moves about a million times faster in silicon than it does in silicon. So we only use it to back up. Or will we actually start to have it do tasks on our behalf? And what happens when the digital version of the brain is working so much faster than the real one and they have an argument? <laughs> and starts telling you that you have to listen to it because it's seen way more than you possibly ever did. Okay, we're going to get into some very interesting stuff even before we start thinking about whether it's even possible to upload consciousness and emotion to those kind of things. But what that does lay the, the basis for is what the singularitarians are very excited about, this idea of the internet brains, where we can start to connect our brains together, network our dreams, network our thoughts, and create this giant kind of singularity. Uh, and you know, one of the writers in the book, Andrew Vladimirov, uh, government for it, like, you know who he is, the guy with all the probes sticking to his head in the picture. He talks about the idea of brains as a service. In the same way as we talk about software as a service, you know, we just go out and break a bit of other people's brains, put a spare capacity on the web if you needed it you know, to get something done. But fascinating ideas. So my time's up, Rick. I think if you look at what's changing, if you look at the speed at which it's changing, organizations are faced with a choice to how we get into the future. And some very clear choices about the design of the business, about why we're here. What are we actually trying to be as an organization? What is the purpose we're trying to fulfill? What are the behaviors we want to display? What is our orientation to the design? Are our old things, Star Wars or Star Trek ones at the play? What's going to be our talent? A talent just the things that clean our robots. Or are they, are we there to really nurture tomorrow's talent and, and are we making a conscious choice to build the capability of the people? And then finally, how do we do it? How do we use technology? What kind of processes do we need? What structures? How do we organize ourselves to then deliver on that? Organize those other resources to make stuff happen? So that's my time. I'm going to take a couple of minutes of questions and then hand on to the others. Comments or questions? Say who you are. Thank you, Rob. Stimulating and illuminating as usual. Um, you've raised several potential questions, and I'll take one in terms of how many state-level organisations have got this on their agenda for the implications of governance, uh, democracy, whatever version of politics they're playing, and would they even be at risk of think, things like blockchain to replace them? And therefore, potentially pocket. So, pretty much every futures conference you go to, or anything that claims to be about the future, there's a debate about the impact of blockchain on the economy and politics. Right. And then the people they ask to talk about it haven't actually thought about it. Exactly. And so they couldn't do it. The people who have thought about it sat in the audience and were all arguing with each other, going, don't, 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 don't you say something? <laughs> um, I think it could have a transformative effect. The problem is it needs to mind blow in the scale. So there's a guy called Vinay Gupta who wrote one of the chapters Sorry. in the book. Vinay Gupta wrote a chap one of the chapters in the book. I write it's about simulation. It's really about blockchain, but it's all about simulation. And, and, and when Vinay talks to you, he's the release manager for something called not the idea, what's Ethereum. It? Ethereum, sorry, brain it. Ethereum is this new platform where you can write blockchain contracts and smart contracts and create your digital uh, autonomous organization. And when VNA starts to talk to me about what we're doing with theory, I give him about 40 seconds before I start him. And then I have to play back what I think I've understood. Then he tells me that that's completely 
anymore, and we start again. It, it is way beyond, you know, most of us to kind of get this stuff first time through. I mean, it's just so different to anything we understand. It's a different philosophy, a different worldview, a different set of assumptions, capitalist notions are all the way So when you try and have that conversation with governments, so the way they have the conversation in the NHS is about cutting the cost of doing NHS, NHS transactions. Yeah. By the way, we'll end up changing the whole way we run the NHS. That is the same discussion. And I don't think many governments have really got it. The Singaporean government was looking at this about four years ago. They, they look well in advance of most people. Their futures unit does genuine futures work. Most futures futures units do what governments allow them to do, right. which is the stuff that might scare us and we want to know the answers to. Are we, sorry, are we, are we saying it the Sir Humphreys or the politicians themselves are the big topic? I don't know. I mean, we, we did a piece... That's fine, let him ask But I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. We did a piece uh, before, not this election, but the last one, on the future of narcotics. And everyone at Wall Street thought we were going to be talking about Albanians, Colombians, Jamaicans, and how we would manage them in the digital age. And we came back to that, actually, that the generation of narcotics, 20 to 2030, is chemists making stuff in their, you know, in their bedrooms. It's people generating electronic fires. It's, it's tiered effects of all this stuff. So your biggest concern is actually that you know Xbox 860 is a drug development mechanism. <laughs> How do you regulate Microsoft, Nintendo, Apple? So you know at that point there was a change of government, and the reports got to the drawer and the battery was like, I know what's ever going to talk about this ever again because it's such a challenge, particularly with those people from your own campaign. Oh, yeah. no, no, no. Uh, really interested that you brought the masculine feminine. Can you expand a little bit? Actually, on that? I didn't. It was uh, all down to this lady here. Right. Okay. Yeah, who, who kind of wrote the first thing, not just the book, went, there's nothing in there about this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, so what, uh, being that you've read that chapter and I haven't yet, um, <laughs> could you expand a bit on that? Because I think it's. It, because obviously a lot of this is the sort of kind of geek's paradise, and a geek is stereotypically a guy, um, and uh, stereotypes, of course. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it's. But what's really interesting, I think, it, there is a lot of there in how we kind of uh, do the feminine and the masculine. And can I that. can I make a suggestion? I, I want to get the other speaker, but we're going to have the discussion afterwards, and I think it will be one of the topics that people will want to talk about. Particularly when they play Gert and Great Talk. Yeah, yeah, right. So let's let's have a kind of broader discussion about that. We don't have a lot of wisdom. We talked a bit, a few bits. I mean, the few bits we did talk about were, you know, if you look throughout the system today, everywhere in the world now, women are outperforming men at pretty much every level of the education system. That is not replicated in the workplace in any kind of way. So either we've got our education system wrong, or we've got something going wrong when they get to the workplace, or they don't. Secondly. There is this feeling that organisations are being described more and more in machine terms, very masculine machine terms, by geek types. And that completely misses what makes an organisation interesting, which is the culture, the connection. You know, you walk into a room, you feel a connection to someone long before you feel a perceiving to them. You know, that's that relationship, which we, we kind of call the feminine. And so there's a, a growing understanding that actually we have to get there. And people are getting there because things like mindfulness, meditation, spirituality work. But they're beginning to touch on that stuff just a little bit. But I'm going to stop there. Um, I hope that makes sense. I mean, I've tried to kind of cover quite a lot of the book in uh, 25 minutes. So forgive me if I'm just a couple of chapters out. Um, I'm going to hand over to Gray now. And Gray's going to talk to us about the singularity and reality. Okay, where's your talk to us? I have lost all the time.